Mike, it's so awesome to have you here on the podcast today. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks, thanks so much for having me, and it's good to see you again. Yeah, it was really great to meet you in Boston at the Boston Marathon at the Tracksmith Brunch, and also running with you was so much fun. I mean, we were like talking the whole time, and I was trying to convince you to swim. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm just so bad at it. I, don't, I, I wish I liked it. I wish I yeah. were good at it. Or I don't even want to be good at it. I just wish I weren't terrible at it. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, I just wish I could figure it out, but I haven't yet. But I love but, talking about swimming. Yeah, I mean, and but you're a runner. So that was where it started, right? Like yeah. you were yeah. like, it was you were having some issues with your running. And I was like, you know, swimming is so good for you. At mm -hmm. least for the at the very least, that is the value of swimming sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get into running? Like, talk to me a little bit about that because yeah. Yeah. I mean, like for me, it was a sport that didn't have cuts and I started in middle school. And so it's like other sports, like you had to have kind of like been on teams before. And I really wasn't on teams for anything. We didn't do a lot of, I didn't do a lot of team sports growing up. And so like, you know, in junior high, you're really like, Oh, I'll try out for the basketball team. Guess what? Everyone's been playing basketball since they were six. And I just like, figured it out last week so like that's not really going to work they're not going to let you be on the team but they will let you be on the track team if you have no idea what you're doing all you have to do is just show up every day and so i'm like i'm good at that <laughs> so i could yeah. be showing up not at track i wasn't great at track but i'm good at showing up when asked so uh that's kind of how it started and um i kind of was I, I did track all through high school and then a little bit into college um kind of like a lot of people did i think and then um, I took a very long break from running for a long time in basically all of my 20s. And then I got back into it kind of like in my 30s and then into my 40s. So that's and so like and so how like what kind of running do you do? Are you a trail runner? Are you an ultra runner? Are you, you know, I know that you do marathons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the shortest way to put it is that I'm a road marathon guy. That's what okay. I like the most to do. All right, cool. So you did, how many times have you done Boston? That was my first time this, this last year when I met you. Um, oh, wow. So okay. Like, I was supposed to do it like the pandemic year, but okay. uh, or like the first year when the pandemic hit and then um, it ended up when it came back, I didn't have a, I don't know if I didn't have a time. I don't know. There was some reason why I didn't do it like that first October, like the fall one. I didn't do that. Yeah. One. But then I was able to get into the following the spring one. And what other marathons have you done? Uh, I'm chasing the six stars now. So now okay. I have four stars. So I've done Chicago, New York, uh, Boston, and Tokyo. I did earlier okay. this year as well. Um, and then I've done a handful of other ones that are not majors. I've done grandmas, LA. Did you just do grandmas? I didn't do it this year. I did it okay. last, the year before. But okay. I wish I were there. It's just a fun race. Um, and the, the energy there is really great. Um, I just didn't work out on my calendar. I got lots of nieces yeah. and nephews and stuff. And so, like, getting away in, like, that May to June window, there's, like, almost always a graduation on any given weekend. Right. So I was lucky that I got away last weekend, last year. But this year was... Nope. I had family obligations. So I couldn't. Yeah. Out. I feel like finding the balance between family and training can be really challenging. And, you know, you've got to like get ahead of it, like with your schedule and with races and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not, I, I, I've never really thought of my running as like, oh, I should plan this out six months, 12 months out. But like, I, right. I mean, that's where I kind of am because things are busy, you know? So it's like, well, doesn't feel so romantic to be like, oh, I'm going to train for this marathon. I'm just going to go for it to be mm -hmm. like, let's put this on the calendar 10 months out, you know, but like, yeah, if you want to do stuff, you, sometimes you got to be annoying and plan, you know? Yeah. I mean, I feel like you can kind of always have like a base level of training that you mm -hmm. can like drop in to a big event, whatever your distance is, like mine's a half marathon, um, that you can always kind of like drop into with a couple weeks notice. But I also feel like, these days, all these races get booked so far in advance and you have to kind of sign up and, you know, get ahead of it. It's, it's kind of frustrating because it's like it used to be and I guess it's good for the sport, right? It means more people are running, but it used to be such a casual thing. You know, you could like show up 30 minutes before the race and just roll in like two days before. And now it's like a whole thing. Most yeah. races. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like even grandmas, like 
I remember grandmas didn't used to like sell out months ahead of time. Yeah. Same thing with like CIM, which is another race I feel like is like they're like sibling races in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think that that was a race that sold out like five months out, four months out. Um, but now it definitely is. And so I do think that makes it harder for like newer runners who are mm-hmm. trying to like go from like, I run a lot to like, I want to really be like kind of into the sport. You know, it's a, it, I think it's a problem. I think it's, yeah. really, it needs to be something done about it, but maybe it just might be like, you know, everyone's still kind of like catching up from like the pandemic years and like digging mm-hmm. out of financial holes from like an organizational perspective. So I'm like, yeah. look, if everyone's fully booked for the next couple of years, I'm willing to, you know, be a little bit patient with it. And hopefully some of these new runners, people that picked up running the last couple of years, hopefully they'll stick around too. So your next two, like as part of your six, the six majors, your next mm-hmm. two are Berlin and did you say London. you did should and London. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so how, so how are you planning to get in? Like, are you doing time? Do you sign up to do the lottery? Yeah, I've done, I've done lotteries for yeah. both of those races for many years now. And I just never, I never get it. Um, okay. I, a joke that I frequently make with people, cause people are, will see the videos that I make from when I do the marathon majors and I'm like, Oh man, how did you get into the race? Or like, what's the process like, or how hard is it to get in? And I'm like, well, the easiest way to get in is to start a social media channel and build a following of 100,000 YouTube subscribers. Oh, that's so easy. And, and then maybe <laughs> you'll get invited to go. That yeah. has worked out easier for me to get into New York and yeah. Boston. Well, Boston, I did earn the bid, but yeah. for New York and Tokyo, that's how I got in. So, yeah. I mean, like that is I mean, the I think, way for me. It's yeah, so hard I mean, to get into these races. Yeah. It is hard to get into the races, and I do think that if you work in media, right, you're, that's what you do, and we're going to talk about that, then, you know, it's like the visibility of you doing it and running with a brand is great, you know, and especially because, you know, not only are you an influencer, but you're also, like, creating amazing content. Um, so I think that, that that is always a smart way. But, it's you know, everything just seems like it's – like so easy, right? But we both know that it's not, right? I mean, to get a YouTube channel to be, you know, to have a hundred thousand subscribers, like that must have taken you years. And it's it's not just like you show up one day and then you have all these subscribers. Like you have to do the work, just like running. Yeah, I mean, it was um, a slow grind for a, yeah. a long time. I've been making videos since about like 2015 or 2016. I mean. I wasn't as serious and as into it as I am now, but like that's right. about when I started making videos for social media. Um, so I guess that's been almost like eight years now. Um, so it's, it's a lot. I've made a, several thousand videos over the course of my time. Yeah. Most of them haven't been watched by hardly anyone. And that's how they deserve to be viewed is not a lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot yeah. of bad videos, but I feel like that's the way to make good videos is to make a lot yeah. of bad ones first. Yeah. Um, or don't worry if they're bad first. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it took a long time. And, and, you know, for me, it's like, there's a lot of really creative people out of, that are out there. There are a lot of really good storytellers that are out there. Mm-hmm. But it to succeed on YouTube requires like, you know, unless you're lucky and can go viral a couple of times. But like, mm-hmm. like, like me um, and the kind of content that I want to make, it really requires a lot of repetition and like consistently showing up. Yeah. So that when people know that like, oh, this is a guy that's not just going to make three videos because he's getting ready for a big race. And then we'll just, right. this is a person that's going to be around and I can like invest in, in like following this person. So now you have, I didn't look today. So what's your, co- in, in like following this person. So now you have, I didn't look today. So what's your current like subscriber list yeah, what's so, your so, number on YouTube right now? Yeah, for YouTube, I think it's like 147, 148, okay. somewhere in there. And so what, talk to me, like for my listeners who aren't familiar with your channel, like talk to me about what it's all about and how you started this channel. And this is your original platform, YouTube, correct? Yeah, yeah, YouTube okay. is yeah. where I started and that's kind of my, that's my primary platform. Yeah. Uh, I'd say there's, right now there's kind of like two, maybe three main types of content. The primary thing is running shoe reviews. So I'm like a shoe nerd and the background for those of you guys who are watching, like, you know, you could see that there's a bunch of shoes that I'm sitting in front of. Mm -hmm. Uh, I enjoy testing out different running shoes, commenting on them, you know, critiquing them kind of like a food critic or a movie critic, but with shoes. Um, And so that's like the bulk of the channel. 
And then other like kind of like main categories of content would be um, what I call my runner's weekend. When I either go to a race or travel anywhere that's running's involved, um, mm-hmm. I'll do kind of like a, kind of like a travel log about that um, and uh, kind of talk about the intersection of travel and running. And then um, the third one might be like every once in a while I'll do like um, um, some like training type of videos, like what I'm doing. I'm not a coach and I don't want to yeah. really be a coach, but like yeah. people are always like, well, what are you doing to stay fit for all these races or recover? You know, so I'm right. like, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. Here's what I'm doing. Tell me what you're doing. You know, like, so that's kind of like the third category. So what shoes did you wear for Boston? Boston, I wore the Adidas uh, Primex Strung. So it's technically an illegal shoe because it's very, very tall. Oh, the but, stack uh, height is over 40? Yeah, it's a 50. Well, I think they say oh. it's like 49.5 or 50. Wow. Of the stack height shoe. And it's got a couple layers of carbon fiber in them. So it's like a very fun, very springy shoe. Um, but, you know, you know, had I been eligible for prize money or for setting a world record, you, yeah. although the course isn't world record eligible, but I wouldn't have been able to because it's an illegal shoe technically. Yeah, they're totally illegal in the sport of triathlon as well. Like, yeah, was, well, I, that's yeah. a recent development, though. Yeah, for, that is a recent because triathlon is a little bit more loosey goosey. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I mean, you know, yeah. I just feel like with triathlon, there's a different emphasis on like, hey, let's try the new technology. Yeah, uh, and a different kind of embrace of new technology. So, I'm, yeah, like, in some ways, I'm kind of surprised that 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 triathlon barred it. But then at least it makes it consistent for people running yeah. marathons on a professional level. Kind of like forty millimeters is like a pretty much like the, the cutoff. Experience. Yeah. That's the, the rocket X two is 40, right? The rocket X two. I don't think it's quite that tall, but it's, get, you know, pretty much all the super shoes at this point are getting pretty close to it. Sometimes for a while, everyone was like, well, we're not going to go 39 or 39 and a half. We're going to be 32 or 36, but now everyone's mm-hmm. pretty much like right bumping up against the limit. Cause yeah. I think that's what the market wants. <clears throat> I think it is. I mean, it's such, I mean, you know, it's, there's such a huge difference. Do you, like now when I go back to like my Mach fives mm-hmm. after running in the Rocket X twos, it's such a different experience. Like, how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, I, I like the differences in experience because yeah. I think of them all as kind of like um, like either like different cars for different types types of driving or like different golf clubs in the bag, mm-hmm. uh, and they're going to be used in different situations. And so like, you know, it the more runners there are and the more into running we all get, like the more we can have room in the marketplace for very specific kinds of shoes. So it's not like we all have just like one of three shoes that we can all buy and then we have to use it for all our running. Instead, we can have like a race day shoe or a workout shoe and then an easy day shoe or a recovery day shoe. And um, we can really have shoes that are finely tuned to what we're wanting on any given run. Now, I know that you work with a lot of different brands, so I'm not going to ask you to give me your favorite shoes, but I would love maybe, can you do top two in for different distances? So like for a marathon, for an ultra, for a speed day, maybe break it up like in line with what you were just saying. Because I think, you know, it's important to develop your quiver of shoes Mm -hmm. as a runner. And so, yeah. Yeah, so for for marathon or half marathon racing, I think that right now I'm really enjoying the Metaspeed Sky Plus, okay. and I also really like the Saucony Endorphin Elite. It's kind okay. of maybe a hot take. Uh, it, does, it seems to be pretty polarizing for some people, but I absolutely love it. Yeah, um, that's a very fun one. Um, and then for like for daily training, I'm a big fan of the Nova Blast Three and the New Balance Rebel Three. I think both of those are. I really like squishy shoes and so like okay. squishy without getting too kind of like gummy. So like yeah. it has a nice spring to the step, but I feel like I could take it for an easy day or a long run and it'd be fine for any of those things. And then, um, let's see for like max cushion. So if you wanted something that you could just be in for a really long time for like a long, slow distance kind of run, yeah. I think like the new balance, fresh foam, more version four is really fun. I also really like the Nimbus 25. So those are nice and like chill, relaxed shoes. And you're coming from the perspective of having a neutral foot, like a neutral stride. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I can't really run in stability shoes. I've tried. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep vi- revisiting kind of the genre every once in a while when there's like, you know, marketing hype about like, you know, it's the stability shoe for even people who don't like stability, you know, those kinds of yeah. things. And I'm like, 
I don't know. I still feel it and I still don't like it. It makes my knees do funny things. So like I, or yeah. it hurts my arches. So like, I don't like stability shoes. And so I try not to review them and I generally ask for brands not to send them to me. Yeah. I'm like, uh, it's not I, your thing. I could run in it, but like, I'm probably not going to like it. And I don't like to make negative reviews. Too yeah, much, I agree. Know? It just, it's I, not fun. And it yeah. feels like you're kind of like, I don't know. It feels like kind of clickbait, like you're just doing it for views, you know, like, yeah. just, I only have so many miles that I can run in a year. So I'd rather spend it on shoes that are going to be fun. To run. And what about the vapor flies? Have you run in those? Yeah, I'm not a huge Nike guy. So okay. um, I don't really do a lot of Nike racing shoe testing. Um, I've run in all the, I haven't run in the new Vaporfly 3, but I've, I've tested all of the, the Nike racing product and they make really good shoes. Um, yeah. About that, but um, not something that I generally spend a ton of time focusing on my channel. I feel like, you know, I have my reasons for that, but then I also feel like the rest of the internet does a really good job of covering Nike race product too. So yeah, you know, people, people aren't missing out. I think we connected over this thing. Like you're not like, you like emerging kind of like edge like not mainstream culture type stuff, but like more cool hip, like. Yeah. You know, I you think know. Uh, yeah. like part of it is like, that's my natural inclination. I've always yeah. kind of been that way. You know, I'm, I was definitely that dude of like, Oh, I like this band before they got big, you know, right. kind of person. Yeah, totally. But I also think that, you know, that's kind of like a, a side effect, a natural like end product of when you review a specific thing yeah. Is that after a while, you're like the thing that like most of the people want and is suitable for most people after a while kind of gets boring for someone mm -hmm. that's running shoes all day, every day. Yeah. And so th that's part of it too, is like, I want to see what's like new and like c coming up next. Um, because that's re really fascinating for me and it's different and it's novel and yeah. it, you know, it's, and so like the longer you do something like this, the rarer novelty seems to be, to become. And so you kind of like chase it a little bit. And so I know that about myself too. And so yeah. like I try to keep that in mind in terms of what I'm really excited about and what I'm not always trying to remember that like ultimately these, the shoe reviews are supposed to help other people. And then yeah. I'll, so, sometimes I talk about stuff just cause I like it, you know, but yeah. like a lot of it's going to be like how it's not that helpful if I'm getting really esoteric about yeah. new shoes. So, you know, I have to balance and kind of like, appease the shoe mega nerds which are a big part of the fan base but also yeah. like, you know the people that are just like i just want to know if this is a real running shoe or if it's just a running inspired looking shoe you know right. so i gotta talk to both audiences yeah and i think like for my listeners if you know a lot of people ask me about shoes and i think like i it's a great to have you as a resource to send people to watch your reviews because you know it's it's good to to when you're exploring something new if you want to discover a shoe like to listen to different reviews and different people but also i think it's so important to try them on to like find a yeah. store where you can try them on and see if they work because just because you know something works for for you or me it doesn't mean it's going to work for someone else and i've seen like so many people wearing the vapor flies that like can barely run mm -hmm. and it's like they're made for people who have like a super efficient stride right or am I wrong? I mean, yeah, I feel well, like, yeah. I think that like the, the nice thing about the Nike, pro they're easy to recommend and it's yeah. almost never a wrong answer, you know? Oh, people love them. Wrong. Yeah. And so like, um, I think the unique thing that Nike has done, and I think they may have the competitive advantage because they had the materials available to them before anyone else, they innovated in that space. Um, is that like the, the product seems to work for a, a pretty large, portion of the, like the marathon racing world. Yeah. And so it's like, it's not, it's one of those things where like, if I don't, if you're, if someone's just like, what's a good racing shoe, I'm like, Oh, you told me nothing about you. And you just want me to give you a name yeah. or something. And that's, pr that's a really nice basic answer to give. It might not be yeah. the perfect answer for that individual person, but chances yeah. are it's a safe bet. Yeah. All right. You've got, you've got me to come around. <laughs> I would recommend, I like the Hoka's, the rocket X twos, but yeah, I get I'm, that. That's yeah. an exciting shoe from them for this year because it's it finally it's kind of like they're they're leaving their comfort zone and yeah. I feel like you know I just mentioned on the one hand I like kind of chase novelty yeah. I've been wanting novelty from Hoka in the racing space for a few years now and so it's yeah. like finally they're delivering so it's it's good to see that happening
Yeah. Did you ever get to try? They they're not making them anymore. I don't think the Supersonics. Did you get to try those? You know, they, they were s- orange. Yeah, they sent me a pair. It had the giant pull tab on the back, but I never, yes. I never tried that one because I went from I think it was just like it was in between Mach four and Mach five, I think. Yeah. And so, for some reason, it got to me really late, and I got the Mach five first, and I was like, Yeah. There's no reason for me to test this one now. No one's. Gonna, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to buy it. So I was like, it's not, it's not going to help. They're not selling it anymore. I had I yeah. I like it a lot, but oh, you, okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of it's exactly between the Mach four and the Mach five. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a good it's a good in between shoe. But I kind of I'm getting used to the Mach fives, but oh, okay. um, yeah. So what's your next race? Like what's com- What do you have coming up? Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be doing a 10 K, which is okay. rare for me. I think I haven't done a 10 K in like four years. Um, and okay. even then that was only like my second 10 K ever. So I'll be doing peach tree road race in Atlanta. So I'm headed okay. down there and it's a, it's a distance. I don't particularly like in temperatures that I don't like. And it's a hilly course, which I also don't like. So, so it's, it should be a fun day. I think. I don't know. It's only I, a couple miles. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard it's a really great event. Uh, it's yeah. one of the biggest road races in the country. And so I'm like, I'm going there to experience the weekend uh, yeah. and see what, you know, see what the hype is all about. I, I, I've done a lot of big road marathons, but mm-hmm. I also want to see kind of like other sides of the sport too. And kind like of shorter like, distances. Mm-hmm. Cause I feel like more people do the shorter distances than do marathons. And so like, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not like missing out on something and just mm-hmm. making sure that like, all right, let's see you know, what this kind of world is like this 10 K world. And so I, I think it should be a fun time. Yeah. I mean, I just did a 10 K for the first time in like forever, actually as the first okay. time. And okay. I, yeah. I loved it. You know, it was in central park. So it was super mm-hmm. hilly yeah. and it was really fun, you know, cause it was kind of like, you can choose. I mean, like you, I don't do marathons, right? So, but you can always choose like if you're racing or you're just running, you can always choose your goal, but <laughs> it just felt like really easy for me to race that distance because it's not that far. So even if for me, it's not that far. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of fun, you know, I wore some fast shoes. I wore my hookahs and I like ran as fast as I could. And it was super fun. It was hot, you know, all right. right. Well, that makes me feel better about it. Maybe I'll feel the same way. I just feel like it's going to hurt a lot, but if you can do a marathon and (laughs) get into Boston, like the, I don't know. I mean, you know, somebody probably will kill me after this and saying this just because they'll be so pissed. But like if the 10 K feels, I mean, if you're not competing to come in, you know, to podium and you're not competing like that, then as it's just like a regular runner, it just feels like a really fun sort of distance to kind of race. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about the half marathon. Yeah. So yeah. like, I feel like, it's another gear entirely to get to that 10 K speed. Yeah. And so I just feel like it's five K pain for twice as long, you know? Yeah. So I'm just like, uh, it is. we'll yeah. see how, we'll see how much I like this. I don't know. I don't, I don't really touch 10 K pace very often. So I don't what, even really know how to pace myself for it. What's your, what is your, um, cause I didn't like look up all your times. Okay. What's yeah. your marathon pace? Like what's your marathon PR right now? Right now I PR'd in Tokyo. I ran a 256. Okay. So like Six forty something, forty five per mile. That's great. Um, yeah. I think it, if I, I I don't anticipate running that fast at Peachtree. I'm, but you I'm, could. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's going to be hotter. It's going to be hilly. Yeah. And um, you know, I since Boston, I've just been kind of doing a bunch of easy running. I've done a couple of workouts to kind of try to get ready for Peachtree, but I've been just doing a lot of just easy running. Not even and I see you're doing a lot of strength training too. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, it's I've been hard. saying for years that I'm going to do strength training. It was like that New Year's resolution that you never yeah. did. It was like your yeah. Favorite. I say it every year. Like every everyone year. has that favorite New Year's resolution that you love yep. to put on the list, and you know you're never going to do happen. it. Yeah, that that was the one for me. But after Boston, I was like, all right, no more excuses. This is the. It's time. really it's really a game changer, but it's like one of those things like you kind of have to stick to it, and you have to do it more than two times a week for it to really work. I know everybody should just do what they can, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, that's, I haven't done any strength training since March. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, not, I'm awful. Yeah. Like, well, 
for me yeah. to get into it, it was like, I used to do it in, in you know, high school and college. Yeah. Uh, Cause, cause somebody was, was telling you to do it. Yeah. yeah. But, um, as an adult, I was just like, you know what? I got to treat this like, just like running where yeah. it's like, I'm out of shape and I don't want to do it, but I want to create the habit. So let's not focus on the lifting part. Let's focus on right. the habit part. The so getting like, there. Yeah. So like, it was one of those things where like, I can go there and as soon as I get there, I can turn around if I feel like it. Yeah. And I never did. Cause once you're there, but you're getting there is the hard part, you know? And yeah. so that was just, and then also just kind of figuring out how to structure the day. So yes. Do it. That also was run, hard, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so like for me, I had to like, I know people say run first and then lift, but I was like, nope, I have to hold it as running as ransom. I want to do the running. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I swear so, like, to God, I don't let myself run. Yeah. In the beginning I was like, nope. I cannot, I'm not going to allow myself to run until I go yeah. to the gym. And so that kind of was like, you know, that was motiv <laughs> That was plenty of motivation. That worked for me for a couple months where I was not going to allow myself to sign up for any half marathons unless oh. I was consistently showing up at okay. the gym. So I started strength training, I think like in November and then January I did the Miami half and then okay. I maintained it through January and February, but then I dropped it. March dropped okay. it off. Like I was done. <laughs> and it's been like several months. I also dropped yoga, which was like a practice yeah. I did for years. Okay. And, um, it's not, you know, it's, it always comes down to like, you are running, uh, and I'm sure you probably run. How many days a week do you run? I run every day. Okay. So, you know, and that's like, you also are working. So it's kind of hard to also add like that other workout. And if you try to couple them together, forget it. <laughs> It just takes too much, too long yeah. to do it like back to back. You know, yeah. like that's the thing about like triathlon training for me. I was it's, just like, yeah. this is too time consuming. I don't know how. Yeah. Well, the, what happens is I started focusing on swimming and swimming and strength training are at the gym. Mm -hmm. And so if I go to the gym once, I'm not going back and I don't okay. want to strength train after I swim because I'm freezing. So yeah. it's like a whole thing. And so then I need to go to the, and everything else I do is outside, right? Like running, yeah. cycling. So it's a whole thing, but this podcast is about you, <laughs> but it's really good for me to hear that like other people struggle with the same thing. And I'm sure a lot of my listeners do too, because there are a lot of triathletes or runners and we all know that strength training is important. It's like, just how do you get it into your schedule? Yeah. yeah it's, hard. it's hard. Yeah. And so before, you know, you also have 50,000 followers on Instagram mm -hmm. and I don't know if you're on Twitter. You want, are you on Twitter? What are this? What other social platforms are you on? Uh, just Instagram. Just Instagram. Mm -hmm. I, I've tried TikTok, but I just, it's not, I'm not, I don't, I don't work over there, I guess. Um, yeah. So it's just, uh, nothing seems to land. So I've given up um, and I'm just going to double down on Instagram and YouTube. Okay. And so when did this, I know this is a big part of your career, mm -hmm. um, but what were you doing before and when did you kind of like, make the transition or are you still doing what you did before? No, I do. I do this full time now. Um, okay. Influencing, which is a word that I know a lot of people that are kind of like my peers and colleagues don't like that word, but I'm just going to go with it. It's a, yeah. it's, a conven it's a convenient shorthand and it's, it explains enough. Anyone that's curious can ask a follow-up question and people who don't care, they're probably going to ultimately get to like, so are you an influencer? So I just got to the chase a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I do that f full time now, but, and that only became full time during the pandemic. I had another, I had a regular job. <laughs> I was a this little... is a major job, by the way, like for people who are listening that don't understand, like I don't even, it takes hours to create a video. Like you may watch it for two minutes, but it takes <laughs> hours, days. It's like a painting, you know, it, it's, it's not just like what you see. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, some yeah. things take longer than others, but yeah, I mean, it, there's, it's, it's become, I, you know, there's, it, it takes up my day, you yeah. know, like, you know, I don't ever feel like I've had that much schedule on the calendar. And then like, you know, next thing I know I'm running behind schedule and everything and I'm staying up real late. So like there is, there's work here. Um, but before I did this like all day, um, yeah. I was a litigation consultant. I had a consulting company. So we would help attorneys that are going to trial and help them with their storytelling and their mainly a lot of their visuals. Um, and so like, that's what I did as a, as a small business owner, mm -hmm. I went to law school and then instead of practicing law, I helped lawyers that were 
um, good at the verbal parts of lawyering in the courtroom, but needed help with yeah. the visuals and the technology. And how did you get into that, like as a lawyer, like as as going to law school and like getting into the visuals? Yeah, um, yeah, it was kind of an accident. I just took a course uh, on litigation technology, and then mm -hmm. uh, the adjunct who ta taught that course had a similar business, and so I just ended up working for him. And so, like, uh, and, you know, I thought that maybe I, I mean, I originally went to law school thinking I wanted to be a patent attorney. Okay. And just sit in the corner and uh, write patents all day. Just like talk to the scientists and be like, what does this do now? And then just like, all right. And then they transcribe that into legalese. Um, but then I realized that I like the kind of like the theatrics and the combative nature of a courtroom, uh, even though it's weird because I'm not that confrontational, but I like structured confrontation, confrontation okay. with rules I, I kind of really like. Okay. And so, um, so like I, I really got, uh, into trial advocacy or trial skills courses. And so I took all the ones that my law school offered. And then I found one that incorporated visual storytelling with like lawyering skills. And I was like, this is fun. I like this. And so originally I thought I would just work, you know, at that consulting firm for a little while and then just go do it myself. Mm -hmm. But I found that like some of like my natural kind of like personality tendencies really likes being kind of like the consulting role rather than the starring role. So, okay. so I got into that consulting space and I really liked that job. And then when, during the pandemic, like, were you just like, it was, nothing was happening. So you kind of shifted your focus. How did that transition and yeah. pivot happen? Yeah. So courtrooms shut <clears> down <throat> and then like the, the, the long-term like re kind of like recovery plan was like courtrooms are not going to open. And like, most lawyers, even trial lawyers who do nothing but trial law, don't spend every day in court. Unless maybe it's okay. criminal lawyers, but they mostly don't spend their day in court. I did because of all my different clients that we were working with at the same time. So a courtroom was being closed, like in the state of Illinois, meant I went from like being busy and having a team of, of people to like no one can do anything. There's no work, hardly any work. Right. Do. So we kept the business afloat for as long as we could. And then I was just like, this is a really big hole. It's going to take yeah. years to dig out of. And I'm like, I've been doing this for 10 years already. I don't have the energy to dig back out. So um, I'm very lucky that my wife has had a very stable job for her entire career and we have kids. And so I was just like, you know, I never really liked how much time the kids were spe spending like an after school care and like not around us. I mean, their days were longer than ours. So yeah. like, um, I didn't really think that was all that great. So initially I thought like, well, I'll just kind of like, stop my day job and be a stay at home dad and still make videos a little bit. But then, um, you know, things kind of took off and escalated, uh, in ways that I didn't necessarily anticipate. So now I really, my wife does not let me call myself a stay at home dad. She's like, I do too much around the house for you to call yourself a stay at home dad. <laughs> was so understanding. Um, but also I think, you know, the pandemic was as much as it was a challenge, it was an opportunity. I mean, because you got to spend more time with your kids and yeah, also, we, yeah. we all got to spend a lot of time with our, with our kids. We <laughs> Maybe want, some people didn't like that, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we did we did the best we could out of it. And we, you know, my wife and I have talked about it too. It's just like, not to say that it was a good time, but I feel like of the ways to under ex, undergo or experience something like that, I feel like we had a pretty good go of it. You know, like yeah. uh, we had really good support structures in place. Um, and, uh, we lived in this, in the city, we're out in the suburbs now, but we lived in the city, but we escaped to her, in, to my in-laws and lived in yeah. rural Iowa for a lot of that time. And so the kids got to spend a lot of time with cousins and grandma and grandpa, uh, yeah. and that also made it for a lot of helping hands around for when my wife was still, you know, she was still working the entire time. Yeah. And so like, and I could try to homeschool the kids. I was not very good at that, but yeah. Um, you know, How old are your kids? They're, uh. Six and 11. Oh, okay. So they yeah. need to be entertained. Like yeah. there was no, yeah, they needed, yeah. yeah. In the beginning, like you know, my, we, my youngest was in preschool at the time. So it's like, I'm not going to sit her in down in front of virtual preschool all day. Right. It just yeah. doesn't make any sense. And so I'm like, all right, well, I guess it's daddy daycare for a little while now. And so, you know, there was, that also kept me busy in, in good ways. And then also yeah. you know, good things from, in terms of like social media, um, came out of it too. Cause that's when I started doing the live stream, which has become a big part of, uh, how I grow community, uh, on the channel. Yeah. Uh, so like some good, a lot of good things came out of it. Like I said, we, we had a good go of it as far as one can, uh, yeah. in a situation like that. Um, but you know, it was an, it was an interesting, it was a strange time. 
And so did you just like, have you felt like since we're now no longer in the pandemic, like, do you feel, have you felt like that rush that everyone's talking about? That's like, you know, we were moving in slow motion and now all of a sudden everything is like all at once. Um, I feel it sometimes and sometimes yes. And sometimes no. Um, I think that, you know, had I stayed in my previous business, Mm -hmm. there would have been a slow ramping up. And then I think everything would kind of would have all like hit at once and it would have been really way busier than I wanted to be. Um, but from like the social media side, I feel it. I do. And then I don't too. Cause okay. I feel like sometimes like the social, like the marketing budgets from a lot of brands that I work with, um, kind of like are cautiously catching up. And then, you know, everyone's, everyone thinks like another recession is about to come. And so like, yeah, are kind of weird. And so like, there has been like a hurry up. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. And then there's a yeah. lot of hurry up and wait and never mind. <laughs> and so yeah. that kind of happens too. Um, so it's been, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but then again, like, you know, as far as me doing this full time, I don't, I'm still learning a lot. There's a lot that I don't know and a lot I'm figuring out. Um, and so, and I don't really know that different. So it's like, it's kind of hard for me to say. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, like the whole business of being a content creator and being a social media influencer, because I mean, you're also like a media person, you know, and like, like there's no old school media has like kind of dissolved. And now influencers and content creators are the real like media influencers that are, you know, bringing new products and new brands and new concepts and new ideas to people, you know, and, and especially like kids today, like any teenager gets all their information from social media, from TikTok, you know, from like beauty products to movies they should watch, uh, to r like running shoes, all of it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's very, it, I mean, the, the way we consume information has all shifted very, very quickly in yeah. ways that like, I think legacy media hasn't had a chance to figure out and catch up to yet. Yeah. Um, legacy media. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, the, you know, legacy media sure, always likes to work. give, um, likes to give the new media pejorative terms. And so I'm not yeah. going to reciprocate, but I think legacy media, legacy media is that, that's not, that's not pejorative. Yeah. I don't think. No, not at you know all. I mean? like, no, I like it. I think it's oh, good. I don't want to say old media, you know, I did, <laughs> but I've worked in media for a long, long yeah. time. Like, so I feel like, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, well, like, I called it old school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think though that like, um, you know, to comment on, it, I feel like at the same time, when it wants to, it can pivot quickly, like BuzzFeed, you know, yes. uh, or things like Tasty, like how that took over. And that was not yeah. like one person thinking, here's the new format that I'm going to make. That was a very carefully crafted corporate product, right? In a, in yes. a legacy media kind of a flavor. Um, but then again, you know, I think, was it BuzzFeed just, was it BuzzFeed that just filed for bankruptcy or something like that? So like, you know, it, it's, it's still figuring itself out. Um, and also so is new media figuring itself out. Cause like, yeah. you know, the longevity of people isn't necessarily decades long because one social media hasn't existed kind of like this for decades yet. Yeah. Um, but also like, you know, people get churned get burnt out. People, you know, churn through whatever their useful kind of like fame life is. I always yeah. joke that I'm at my 14 and a half minutes of 15 minutes, you know? So like, yeah. I might be gone pretty soon here too. Um, so it's like, you know, I'm not saying that one's better than the other, but like, there's definitely very big differences, but being small or one person team, like I am, lets me yeah. pivot much faster. You can pivot faster, but it's a lot of work. That's, this is my, it's you know, you, so you can be as creative as you want and it's your channel and it's, you know, your vision, but you know, it's also all you. And even if you had like an assistant or some people helping you, it's still all you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, a, yeah, you know, that has its own challenges too. Cause then it's just like, there's no one telling you this is a good idea, but it just didn't hit this time. Keep going. Yeah. Versus like, well, there's, well, there's lots of people telling you that <laughs> uh, in, in the comments, um, yes. but there's like, there's no like formalized structure. Like I don't have an editor, like an right. editor in chief. If I were like worked at a magazine to say yeah. like, this is really great work. I can tell it's great work. Just, keep going. Maybe the next story will be the one that really takes off versus like, this was a bad idea or like a concept yeah. that was bad. And so like, that's when things can get really tough, especially yeah. for, I think, for new creators too. It's like, 
you know, I spent a lot of time in that like under 1000 subscriber kind of territory yeah. a yeah. really long time. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, it, should I just stop? Like, is this worth continuing? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I don't know. Or do I need to completely change what I'm doing? You know, like, so th those are the hard things that you have to figure out yourself. So you not only have to be like the talent, you also have to be the yeah. editor, and you also have to be like the business person too, yeah, and the business person too. Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's like any other kind of business. I don't have the motivation. Why am I doing this? And, and then you do it and you know, people love it. And then there's some days where you think something's amazing and you do it and it sucks. And it's like, that is like every single entrepreneur founder I've interviewed on this podcast, including myself, all has those things. And so I think like when you're a content creator, like, I don't know that a lot of people know this, but it's like, you're running your own business and you have those days you have to have, um, do you have like a board of directors, like f friends and family that you kind of like run things by? No, 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 that's no. Like way more structured than I am. <laughs> I've done, I've, I mean, I've done structured before I've yeah. been in the business for 10 years. So like I've done structured, even then I wasn't that structured but yeah. like, uh, for this. I don't really, but what, you know, kind of what I do is I do have like a cohort, you know, of people yeah. that are our friends and yeah. they, they end up showing up in a lot of the videos. We're in the same spaces and uh, a lot of times we'll bounce ideas off each other. It's nothing. Yeah. I mean, it probably should be more structured in terms of like we have a regular meeting or something like that where we can talk and, you know, and um, feed off of each other and help each other mm -hmm. grow a little bit more. But for me, it, like it seems to work for me right now where it's like, you know, we will encounter each other at a lot of similar events um, and are doing a lot of similar work and also, you know, interfacing with a lot of the same kind of partners. So we can be like, yeah you know, trading notes a little bit on like, Hey, how did they treat you? Here's how they treated me, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so like, it's, I guess it is like a board of directors, but it's just like, it's a, yeah, I, um, I, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I think that like, uh, if nothing else, like having board of directors of, or I call it a cohort, you know, yeah, that's uh, good. Or your, or your squad or whatever you want to call it is important just cause like, man, our significant others don't always want to talk shop or they yeah. don't, they they're interested and they probably can pick up stuff, you know, because they've heard yeah. about so much of it. But I'm like, when it comes down to it, like it, sometimes it's good to like, you know, I, I, I work now with people who are recording things and recording themselves all the time, but sometimes yeah. it's really good to like have a cocktail and like turn off all the recording devices yes. and just like vent a little bit, you know? And that's what, another thing, like if nothing else for your mental health and just, to help get through some of the rougher spots, having a group of people that you can kind of do that with is really important as a, a creative person. Yeah, actually speaking of mental health, I mean, you are spending a lot of time creating content for social. So you also, in order to grow your audience, need to go on there and comment as well as interact with people. So do you spend a lot of time on social media and how do you kind of like safeguard yourself? Yeah, I spend a lot of time on social media is quote unquote, like researching, you know, mm -hmm. so like, I just I enjoy social media a lot. And so it's yeah. not hard for me to spend a lot of time there. Um, and I think that like, you know, I think Instagram and YouTube are kind of like two different kind of like uh, mental health minefields, if you will. Yes. Like for me on YouTube, it's like the comments are, are the place where I start to feel negative energy a lot. And I joke with my audience, um, like the core audience, like that comes to like the live stream that like, I can tell when a video is doing well, when I get grumpy comments. Cause then okay. like, my regular videos that perform regularly well, get sent to kind of like the same people and they know me and I know them and we're commenting and we're having conversations and we know each other. So there's like benefit of the doubt that happens. Okay. If I say something a little awkwardly or if a comment reads a certain way, I know not to like get super tense but like if a video suddenly does well youtube's like oh people like this video let's show everybody and then yeah. that everybody may not like what they see or they may not like like the way i'm saying things or it yeah. just might be like i don't like that dude's face you know or like i don't like that dude's voice he's putting me to sleep completely like things i have no control over you know have nothing to do with the quality of the video or even right. the content you know like the what the message is and so like sometimes you just get negative comments like that um, and you can't and, uh, delete them. Yeah, sometimes I these days sometimes I do. 
Yeah. Because I'm like, you know what? People come here for the community part too. So yeah. I feel like I'm a steward of the space. You know, mm -hmm. this isn't a town square. You know, this is a clubhouse. So like, you know, it's my job to make sure that the vibes are right here. And so like, if I see stuff that's negative, I'll just delete it. I don't care. Yeah. I think I would do that. I delete like spam comments all the time. Oh, spam but, for sure. I'll, I'll mark spam yeah. on other people's comments too. Like yeah. if it's like oh. make $75, $750 a day, I'm like spam. I don't care if it's yeah. Marnie's comments. Yeah. Like, but I'm here to help out. I'm going to clean up. You know? Yeah, I totally do that. I do that also because it's just so obnoxious. But yeah. and then like, you know, like how do you co deal with the algorithms? Because I know that, you know, YouTube and Instagram are constantly, you know, changing their algorithms. So how do you kind of stay up to date and deal with that? Yeah, I try. It's it's weird because like I say that I don't care about it too much, but then I'm also completely driven by them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm not sure exactly how I draw the lines on one way or the other. I feel like there's a benevolent side to it. You know, I feel like a lot of times when people say algorithm, it's funny if you replace the word with like a, the Lord God, our savior, then okay. it sounds like you're talking about uh, social media as like a religion and it, like the language and the way people talk about it is very similar. It's strange. Okay. Like, I feel like that our Lord God and savior or the algorithm is very benevolent at times. And so like it's, it's freeing to me because I can make experimental content and the algorithm will um if it stinks won't show mm -hmm. so i can make a mistake in a public space that no one will see and so there's really mostly only upside to experiment okay. with content because if it yeah. works the algorithm will spread it to everybody but if it doesn't it just gets hidden it gets pushed down because there's so much other content that exists so yeah. like your mistakes are pretty much invisible like think about all the the creators that you like you're like man they, this person never misses everything they post is a hit. There's a reason why you think that it's because the algorithms only show you the ones that are good or the uh. ones that, at least the algorithm thinks are good. And so I feel like in some ways the algorithms are freeing. And then in other ways, I feel like, you know, people chase them a little bit too much in terms of like water trending topics, you know, yeah. like for a while, everything was exploding on YouTube. Right? Yeah. And so, or everything was cut open with a knife on YouTube. And so like, there are certain things that I just don't chase you know, I don't yeah. care about that. But then there's other things that you really do have to pay attention to the algorithm. Like it really likes things that are much faster paced, you know? And so like, then you kind of tweak your editing a little bit to kind of like make sure that the algorithm understands what you're doing mm -hmm. so that it can understand who to give you to. So like, you kind of have to like, you kind of have to- And that's on YouTube. Like, yeah, both on YouTube and on, and on um, Instagram as well. Um, you kind of have to like identify yourself to the algorithm so it knows what to do with you. And so, oh my God. That's, that's like, like, I can't even do that with myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you already yeah. are though, you know, and you're doing it in an intuitive way. I guess I'm making it just sound much more complicated than it no, is. No, 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 like, no, you are not. No, you're not. Like, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Like as somebody who has like, you know, 20 years experience in brand marketing and like brand strategy. I mean, everything you're saying is spot on. It's just really, it's really hard to do. So it's, you know, to like, think about like, all those things, and then like, pay attention to like, it's like a movie, it's like moving parts, like you're, you're not in a vortex, you're not operating by yourself, even though it feels like you might be. And if it's your business, right, then you need to be on top of what's happening, and what's going on and decide, are you a trend person or not? Yeah. I mean, some people do those trends and it works really well for them. Uh, it just hasn't been my style though. So I'm not saying that trend followers are bad, but I'm just saying like, you have to kind of like pick some lanes, at least in the beginning, yeah. and start getting some traction. Right. And then from there you can, and, you know, and so that way, if you just jump around a lot, then the yeah. algorithm doesn't know what you are. And so right. it, it, it doesn't it know where to send you. It can't help you. So. Well, that's what I like about TikTok is that you can use hashtags and get on the For You page and then it kind of like puts you in that like genre of like who you're talking to. But I mean, my like my business has always been, you know, in terms of like the forward facing has always been, you know, the um, podcast. And so I never really focused on mm -hmm. unique content on my Instagram was private until <clears throat> probably the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I just was never using it for that. And I put, you know, it was before the pandemic and I was, you know, I put pictures of my family on and I just wasn't really a public 
person on Instagram and also, and YouTube, forget it. Like <laughs> I told you, I was like, I've been posting videos of, you know, my podcasts uh, from Zoom. So I have no legs to stand on, but I am paying attention and I feel like, you know, rule of thumb, like not all platforms are the same and not all content is good for every platform. Like I love YouTube shorts, but you know, I'm not using, I'm not using a lot of these channels, but I think it's interesting, you know, and I think, you know, after meeting you and, you know, having Tommy on the podcast, Tommy runs and like, you know, just really paying attention to the space and just simply using as a platform as someone who has a podcast or advising brands on using as a platform. I think it's really important that, you know, you really take it seriously and you need to apply your brand verticals to your channels and all those things. What's, what are some tools that you really like that you're using that you would be happy to share right now to create your content and videos? Yeah, I, I love the GoPro. Um, I okay. think that is, uh, that's usually what I recommend for people if they have zero action cameras is to start yeah. with a GoPro. Um, okay. For most people, that's all they'll ever need um, as far as like an action camera. The Insta360, I like as a second camera. That's kind of how I prefer to use it because um, then it gives me kind of like a different kind of angle that I, know, I don't know if I want every day. But every mm -hmm. once in a while, depending on where I am, um, like the locations uh, might call for using something that's going to be a little bit more kind of like ooh, experimental or giving some different views. Um, so GoPro would be the number one. And then I like to run either with um, like a little alligator clip. Um, they sell them so that they go on like your backpack or whatever, but you can kind mm -hmm. of like open it up so you just hold it. So Or just like a really small handheld grip. Um, yeah. It's a great way to start because it's not as much stuff and mm -hmm. things really lightweight so that's how i ran like my first two marathons with like okay. a really small stubby grip for my gopro um just so that your hand's not holding the camera because in your yeah phone, so you don't run like with your phone in the no i don't No. yeah no that, that i just feel like the phones are great they do really good stuff but like for me and what i want to do like it just yeah it's, it becomes a lot of stuff um, so what like what advice would you give to other content creators if they want to shoot video? Like, um, I would say if you want to shoot like action shots from whether you're on the bike or when you're running, mm -hmm. um, get a camera. doesn't have to be the latest and greatest. Like if you have zero cameras, pretty much anything from the last like two, three years is going to be fantastic for you. Yeah. Um, and practice a lot, practice a lot. Cause like, you know, like I run with a GoPro every day. Um, yeah, because I'm reviewing shoes. So like all of the yes. footage that I have can get put into the review video for later. Um, but like, I feel like a lot of people buy the camera like a month before their marathon, they try it two <laughs> or three times. And then they're like, I don't know why this video isn't great when they yeah. go to shoot it. Cause then number one, you haven't really practiced your angles and what it's like to actually run with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also haven't practiced editing a, a lot. And so like, if you want to make the good content, you got to make a lot of content. And so right. that requires you like bringing the camera with you a lot of the time and it looks dorky and you might get a lot of weird looks depending on how busy it is where you're running. Um, but it's like, uh, these days people kind of know people have seen it before. And so it's, yeah. like, it's, not, it's not that weird anymore. So do you plan out like when you do like your storytelling, cause your videos are really good and mm -hmm. you have a unique sort of angle that you're shooting and you also have a story that you're telling. Like, do you sort of have a calendar that you're planning this out and then you sort of go out, shoot your B roll, like you're shooting a movie or a TV show, like B roll. And then the focus is that. Yeah. So, um, some days, some, some weeks I'm more structured than others. Um, mm -hmm. Like this last month, because my running hasn't been very structured, the videos haven't been very, the, the video planning hasn't been very structured. Um, but like, you know, as I'm picking like a shoe to wear on a particular day, I'll think about like, all right, well, like for example, today, I ran in a shoe that is under embargo, the embargo lifts like end of the month. But to have a video that comes out at the end of the month, I need to run in it a couple of times before yeah. and make the video. So I'm like, all right. So like I've marked on the calendar, all right, these days, don't forget to run in this new shoe. Uh, yeah. And then, so like, those are the kinds of planning that I have to do. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. well, this is a workout shoe. So like, all right, all right what are the workout days going to be? And so you kind of have to map it out. So it adds like a little, little element of 
planning to the running, but you know, I, I like thinking about running and stuff like that. So like, yeah. it's all fun for me to, to kind of have that, have that structured where it gets a little bit more difficult is when I'm collaborating with other people. So mm -hmm. if it's like a video that requires multiple people, or if I'm like scheduling like interviews and stuff like that, that, that takes a little bit more planning because it's another person's calendar that's involved. Right. Um, but for the most part, I just kind of like map out like, all right, this is where I want to, it's kind of like when you're planning out your training plan for a race, Yeah. here's the race date. Now, how do I work backwards from there? And so there's, right. a lot, there's a little bit of planning, but not yeah, too much. I totally, I totally get that. What's your next, are you train? what's your next, like, what's your next video that you're making? Is this the embargo video? No. Uh, so like I try to make two to three videos a week. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I like to mix it up between like new shoe videos and like uh, longer term review videos. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any shoes that are going to be, Oh, I do have a longer two term video that's coming up. So like right now I've got a couple that are, are lined up. Like Friday will be a Pegasus 40 video. Okay. Mon Monday will be a Nimbus 25 after a hundred miles video. So that's a longer term review video. And then I'm, and then I think then the embargo shoe will be at the end of next or in the middle of next week. And then I'll be going to mm -hmm. Atlanta. So then there'll be some travel content that gets okay, made. Cool. So be the following week will be a travel video going to Atlanta, experiencing run culture out there. I'll be doing a live show down there too. So like that'll all kind of get put into it. Um, you get a little bit kind of behind the scenes in that video. So there's cool. it's a different kind of filming yeah. um, rather than me like filming shoes in a studio and like my feet when I'm running. So it's a little bit different. Got it. Um, and that'll be kind of like a lot of next week's content so that's kind of Fun. like a video schedule for that's like a, a snippet of what like an average two weeks is kind of like for me and do you have any mentors in the space that you look to or maybe not mentors but like you know other creators that you are inspired by yeah i mean like a lot of the people are the ones that are like in my cohort i don't know if they know okay. they're in my cohort but like i call them my cohort so like the people that like believe in the run i'm friends with those guys i like what they're doing um, like Tommy runs, you had him on the podcast. Yeah. Like I talk with him a lot about, um, the content that I'm making, um, uh, and then the content that he's making. So those are two, two people I've talked to a lot. Um, Drew Whitcomb is someone that I've been talking to a lot as well. He works at wear testers. Okay. Um, and so, you know, there's just other people in the space that, um, I not, I might not necessarily run ideas by them, but like, you know, we'll talk about, um, sometimes nitty gritty stuff. Like I was talking to Robbie, I believe the run about like getting merch made, you know? So yeah. like, I'm like, how, how do you do that? Do you screen print that in house yourself or you farm that out? You know, like that, those kinds of questions to other things like our views down for you guys this last quarter or like, has right. it been weird? Or like, wasn't or like, was February, March really weird for you guys? I felt like we got a lot more shoes in February, March than we normally do. And they're like, oh yeah. You know, so like, we'll kind of like talk about stuff like that. So those are the kinds of conversations that I might have with them. And sometimes that becomes a deeper conversation and other times we'd be like, yep, sure was weird, you know, and that's it. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's cool. It's good to have people like that in your circle to kind of talk to and run things by. Yeah. You know, cause like, so not everyone does that in the space too. Like, so like some people are like, they want to be, you know, lone wolves. Um, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I could do that. I just feel like it would get real lonely real fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, I want to work with other people. I want to have friends that are, you know, quote unquote competitors, Yeah. but I want those competitors to be on my team and, yeah. and like, and we can grow together and we can all win. You know, I just feel like social media is so big that it's like, there's very little like zero sum situations. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are, can be like infinite sum situations where it could be win, 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 win. Yeah. It's a win, lose or a, or a lose, lose, you know? So like, you know, there's ways to bring a lot of people in and it's gratifying on a professional level too. So that's something that I recommend for a lot of people making content yeah. There's a lot of places to get negative, but like, you know, you got to find some people that help you stay positive. Yeah, that's awesome. This is really, that's awesome advice. Thank you so much.